isn't it better that at least no it's not really is it it should just but they're in us some of the uh, uh, look, obviously we're not going to solve this problem today are we Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace. More on Squarespace in just a bit. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to a brand new episode of Brain Blaze. Weapons here. Danny Rice with your scripts. More things Americans think are totally normal, but others find bizarre. Oh, this is... We've done the, uh... We've done the British ones. And with those, I'm always like... <laughs> Other people find that weird. This is totally normal. What? <laughs> Everyone must do it like this. And then I read these American ones and I'm like, Americans are weird. Anyway, let's crack on. Ice, ice, baby. Johnny Bingo slams open the doors of the last chance saloon, spits out his cigarette, holstered his pistol, and ambles slowly up to the bar with a swagger that would have left Chuck Norris quaking in fear under his mother's skirt. It should be noted that Johnny Bingo is a Yorkshireman, and the last chance saloon was a grotty pub in Pontrefract. Danny, what are you talking about? The cigarette was a candy stick, and the pistol was loaded with water. But Johnny's request at the bar was mean and moody. He wanted a scotch and fast. All was going well until the bartender suddenly decided to shove a bunch of ice cubes in the glass without asking. The expression on Johnny Bingo's face could have curdled a banana milkshake. The bartender may as well have dipped his penis into the glass. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what is going on here? Who doesn't like ice? Wait, do we are we do Americans love ice or not love ice? I thought Americans loved ice. Although it would be weird, you you would ask whether someone wants ice in a in a whiskey, because that's a personal preference. Why would anyone contaminate a perfectly good scotch with ice? Maybe it's Americans who are weird for having such an unusual obsession with ice, or maybe it's the rest of the world who are weird for generally serving their drinks at room temperature. Who serve drinks at room temperature? That's not, that is weird in itself. I mean, no, no one's serving you. You have it out of the tap and it's cold out of the tap, like water, or if you're making a, a squash or a cordial or something. But otherwise, you don't have a Coke sitting around, like, out in the room at, like, 20 degrees, and they'd be like, that's nice. You have it in the fridge, right? That's not an American thing. And also, ice is awesome. If it's Americans loving the ice and the rest of the world not, I'm with the f Americans on this one because ice is where it's at. Like, I'm always into ice. I think I'm more into ice than most other people, which might imply that this is an American thing that I just happen to enjoy. Fascinating, Simon. Let's go. I'm probably not the right person to comment as I don't even shove ice into my drinks on a sweltering hot day. I, see if, I feel as if ice shouldn't be rattling around in my glass. It's a bit like making a nice cup of proper coffee and then dropping croutons into the mug. No, I completely disagree. Ice is awesome. I love ice. I don't know why I love ice so much, but ice is just f***ing killer. But I can obviously understand why optional ice might enhance a refreshing summer drink anywhere else in the world. It's just that America goes mad for it in comparison to the rest of the globe. You know one thing I hate? If we start talking about crushed ice, I'll slap so I'll, I could slap someone in the face if they... I, that would be like dipping their penis. You, like, you go somewhere and it's like you have a Coke. What's that f***ing restaurant? Is it, is it Nando's that do crushed ice? I hate that. It's just... It's just nonsense. It melts faster, so it waters down your drink. And it's impossible to drink it. It's like you're kind of drinking it like this, and all the bits of ice are getting in your teeth and, like, causing brain freeze. And you're trying to drink your Coke, but it's literally just clogging up the f***ing thing. You're like, why? I just wanted ice. Why did you crush it? It's more work, and it makes it more shit. Why is crushed ice a thing? Why am I so angry about crushed ice? Probably because f I love Nando's, but you with your crushed ice, you piece of shit. It's the default option for cold beverages even in winter. An entire glass of soda is often crammed with ice before anyone considers pouring in the actual drink. An extra cup of ice is sometimes ordered to put on the side in case the first lot melts too quickly, really. America just can't get enough of this stuff. Frederick Tudor is partly to blame as well, as he was the entrepreneur who launched the great American ice industry near the beginning of the 19th century. Nicknamed the Ice King, Frederick was responsible for exporting quality American ice to tropical climates for the first time. The operation turned into a smooth success once it figured out how to stop his product melting before it reached the customer, along with all of his profits. And the Ice King later turned his attention back home, convincing the American hospitality industry that drinks should be chilled with his ice as standard. I... I don't find this weird. I love this. I love that this was exported, and I don't often, like, normally I'll just drink the drink out of the can because I can't be bothered to pour it into a glass. And also, in a way, if it's in the glass and there's not a can, I kind of feel like it's missing ice. Just me. Fing love ice. Fing you, Danny. <laughs> 
Just kidding. I love you, Danny. It's a trend which very briefly caught on in Victorian England and it was deemed too expensive and dismissed as a passing fad. Perhaps part of the reason that grumpy Europeans aren't quite as keen on ice is that we feel we're being conned if we pay good money for a drink which has been suspiciously topped up with cubes of frozen water. Now that is a fair point. Because sometimes you'll go somewhere. Like, and I do find this true. But often in America, they'll just fill up your drink for free, right? If you, if you like, order a soda it will come and then you drink it and like at uh, most like chain restaurants and shit and they'll bring you another one for free right or like right is that true is that i feel like that's how america works um but in the uk they'll be like no 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 you gotta there's no chance that shit, you're paying another one and it'll be like three pounds four pounds and you're just like okay i'm just gonna sip on this really slowly and if anyone put if that was full of ice and you weren't getting a free refill it'd be like uh f- you i just <laughs> bring me the can and this is not a problem in America, thanks to another glorious, quirky concept. The free refill! Uh, yes! Tourists are often taken by surprise when they realize that they don't have to pay for a second soda or coffee in many American establishments where beverages are not the main money spinner. And again, I f***ing love this about America. This is a great thing. I mean, you might have, you might look at the menu and it'll be like, oh yeah, $2.50 for a Coke. And then you get the bill and it's actually like $17 once they've added like tax and tips on there. But the fact that they'll bring you like seven of them is really great. And then you get back in the car and you're like, oh my God, I need a slash so bad right now. <laughs> it's a cost effective strategy for business as you make their money on food, as the actual cups often cost more than the soda. And nobody minds how much room the ice is taking up because the next one is on the house. I'm with Johnny Bingo on the whiskey thing, though. I'd be just as unimpressed if a bartender diluted a perfectly good scotch without asking. A proper scotch has no place on the rocks. Agreed. Um, I do like ice in bourbon. Like, uh, generally, the cheaper it goes, the more I'm into putting ice in there. There's no way I'm putting it like a single malt whiskey or like a nice blend or a particularly fancy bourbon. I'm not putting ice in that. Little drop drop of water to open it up. And that's about it. Well, excuse me, princess. Still, if that free refill concept had ever caught on in pubs and bars, I'd be able to take up permanent residence in the Last Chance Saloon, and you can serve me whatever you damn well like. But there are some very occasional places where it's like, yeah, yeah, no, you can just, it's free refills on beer. And it's like, what? <laughs> okay. I'm about to get f***ed up. Look, I'm going to interrupt today's video because there's a very important message from a sponsor who you've never heard before. You've never heard an advert for Squarespace before, have you? I've got to tell you who Squarespace are, what they do, because this is just unfamiliar territory. Look, that's sarcasm. I've done a bunch of reads for Squarespace. There are, everyone's talking about Squarespace. You know, they're like one of the biggest sponsors and that's because they're one of the biggest places to make a website. And this is one of those cases where biggest is best. You think of making a website, why would you think of anywhere else? You'd be like, oh yeah, no, I need a new website for my business. I'm gonna go to like, John's web design down the street. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? It's going to be expensive. I know mates of mine who've built websites for businesses and stuff, and it gets into the thousands, thousands upon thousands. And then you look at the websites, kind of shit, and you're like, mate, <laughs> what happens? And I mean, honestly, just go to squarespace.com. You go there, there's a little quiz. Like, let's say you're running a business, right? You want to sell stuff online. They do stores, by the way, which is neat. And so you just go there and you're like, well, yeah, I want to sell widgets. And uh, there's a little quiz. They, you want to sell widgets? What sort of style do you like? Let's start. And they're like, cool. Here's some templates you might like. And you will like them because they're all beautiful. Then you just click on them and uh, you adjust the text. You adjust the pictures. You put in like, I don't know, a picture of your smiley face on the about page. Like, hey, buy my widgets or whatever. Or I don't know if you're a photographer. You could put in, like a booking thing or a contact form. You could ask people to put your emails, their emails in there. Being like, yeah, I'm interested in your photography services, but I don't know when. Maybe later. And then you get this email list. You can email people and be like, oh, I got a special deal. Close that sale, baby. Maybe. That's what Squarespace is about. And uh, blogs, I don't know, all of that website y stuff. It's just the easiest way to go in 2022 and years before, and I know years afterwards as well. There's no there's no jargon there's no technical stuff i don't know anything about making websites i'm not good at this but even i managed with squarespace and i mean i'm a little bit technical know-how-y but not very much and even if you have none, look, so as long as you know how to use a mouse, you'll be fine. That's how easy it is. Plus, once you're up and running, there's a bunch of extra stuff that'll be useful. They mentioned here, yeah, blogs, I mentioned that. Email list, I mentioned that. God, I'm nailing them all today. Analytics, yeah, so you know, people, you know, you can see where they're coming from, how much time they're spending on the website. 
if people are actually coming to your website at all you know it's all very important stuff if you're doing that kind of thing because you you know it's a bit sad if you're like, yeah, no one's reading it <laughs> <laughs> you need to know that. So look, go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash blaze to save 10% off your first purchase for a website or a domain. And now back to today's video. Forgotten vacations. This is one of the things that I find hardest to wrap my head around. Americans often forget to claim their paid days off work. In fact, America is one of the most overworked places on the planet. It is considered to be a no-vacation nation by many. Holidays from work are very much celebrated in Europe. The EU requires employers to grant all workers a bare minimum of 20 paid vacation days. But most countries and respectable corporations go way above that figure. Yeah, 20 would be low. 20 paid vacation days, which you can like spin off into much longer because that's just work days. So that's basically a month off because you could just do plus you can work in holidays like sometimes here obviously i'm self-employed so i don't get any of this joy there like a few weeks ago there was a week and there were two bank holidays in the middle of the week so wednesday uh, tuesday and wednesday were bank holidays everyone takes off monday wednesday monday thursday friday and you've got like a nine week stretch for three va- a nine day stretch for three vacation days which is pretty sick <laughs> And that doesn't include bank holidays. When I worked for RBS, I was given five weeks of paid holiday, but I was also allowed to buy a sixth week off, which was deducted from my wages in small monthly chunks. That's pretty awesome. I mean, I like what I do. I love what I do. And I also realize I can take as much holiday as I want because that's how it, I, how it is. But it's also like where it's like you have to take this time off. I mean, like... Because I'm often I'm like, well, I also like I like work. So it's like, do you want to like go on holiday for a week or go to work? And it's like, well, it's, it's, I like both. Excuse me, what are you doing? Speaking of RBS, there was a guy working there called Colin who, without fail, would greet everyone in the morning with a countdown to his next holiday. <laughs> That's got to look good for his boss, right? Hey, boss, just let you know, 364 days. <laughs> so, no, nah, it's unrealistically long. But like. Is like, Colin, do you care about your job or do you care about holidays? Like, just about the holiday, boss. Colin not, is not getting promoted. Colin probably doesn't care about getting promoted, though, to be fair. So even if it only just returned from a two-week break, Colin's opening line on his first day back would be, only 53 days until I'm off. To be honest, this got a bit tedious after six years. <laughs> but it goes to show how open we are about the whole idea. This is why we turn up to work every day and we plan well ahead for our holidays with eager anticipation. Yeah, this is not this is a weird British thing. We'll book our holidays like a year. I don't, because I'm just not that organized. I'm pretty organized. Like I'm very organized when it comes to work, but uh, holidays, I'm not. Like I was supposed to go to the UK to visit my family. We do like one weekend a year. I mean, we do more than one weekend a year, but there's one big weekend where we try to get everyone together like all of my cousins not my cousins my kids and my sisters and their children and my parents and we all get together and the, my parents were like super slow about it they were like telling me like three weeks ahead and then i was sick for a week and then i went to book it as like there's literally no flights my favorite operator stopped operating from prague to the uk so i'm like oh brilliant and so i look at easyjet and it's like there were literally no flights back on the sunday and there was one flight at seven o'clock on monday morning and uh, that means you got to get to the airport like what 5 30 leave for the airport four <laughs> and it's like i'm sorry but with two kids i'm not i'm not just that's just not happening so i'm not going <laughs> sorry uh, it. well that is very interesting please tell me more i need more notice is what I'm trying to say. Why am I even telling this story? It's not relevant. Let's carry on. In contrast, American workers are more likely to treat vacations like a sinful, dirty secret. More than half of American workers admit to feeling guilty about taking paid time off, and a 2019 survey revealed that 55% of them didn't take all the vacation time which they were legally entitled to, leaving a total of 768 million unused paid, paid days off in the bank. F***ing hell. Do you not get the money back for that, though? Because I remember when I worked at Sainsbury's back in the day, I didn't. I think they're just not very good. Like the bosses were just not very good at communicating, or maybe it was more sly than that. But I remember I left for university or whatever, so I was obviously like, "Ah, oh, you, I'm out, bitch." No, I wasn't. I was like, "Thanks for the opportunity. I'd love a reference." Um, and so I left, and then I just got like a payment slip or whatever for like it was like six hundred quid or something, and I was like. Hell, what's this for? And they're like, well, you didn't take any paid vacation days on the two years you worked for us. And I was like, D -d -d what paid vacation days? <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, or like unpaid vacation or whatever. Either way, they had to give me a bunch of money. And I was like, 
awesome. Because I was just going off to university and I was like, what am I going to spend this 600 pounds on? Booze! It was great. I was so happy about that. It seems like so... I mean, it's a lot... It's not a lot of money, really. Is it a lot of money? I don't know. But it seems so little now. But it made such a big difference. It, like, the smile on my face when that random payslip came through for no reason was like... That, 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 I, this is the best day of my life! <laughs> I'm rich. A big part of the problem is that the US is pretty much the only advanced economy in the world not to offer a legal right to guaranteed paid leave. A quarter of workers don't get any guaranteed paid leave at all. That is f***ing brutal, America. I'm into work. I'm into capitalism. But f*** me. No mandatory days off at all. Holy s***, America. And the decline of the unions means that there's very little job security in America and nobody seems to be bothered about fighting for working rights. Firing a European employee can often involve a long and painful procedure, but in America you get fired at the drop of a hat. Uh, and this seems to have led to a situation in which workers are nervous about bringing up the subject of vacation to their employer and the conversations are often discouraged. <laughs> Jesus Christ, this is really savage. An American worker is more likely to worry that they're letting the side down if they ask for their rightful time off, or that they might be seen as a slacker, or that they'll miss out on some future career opportunities, or even get replaced altogether. A culture of fear has led some American workers into believing that time off from a busy business is just not a viable option. I mean, fair. But it's like, I find sometimes that it's hard for me to take time off because I've got so much to do, but it's my business. I'm the one who benefits from all of the like capitalism that goes on here. So I understand why I feel that pressure. But like, if you're just working for a business and it's like making like someone else is like money or like a giant business, like just the random shareholders, which are probably just giant, like, uh, what are those like pension funds and shit. Oh my god, why do you give a f And this is quite handy for the companies who end up getting their employees to work whole days and weeks for nothing at all, when they should really be lounging by the poolside with an exotic cocktail and a copy of the Communist Manifesto. <laughs> That's gotta be a bad. that should be a banned book in America, otherwise they're gonna get ideas. Another more recent worrying trend is that even when workers do manage to claim a vacation, they're finding it harder to disconnect entirely from the office and end up logging on to answer work emails, leading to a growing belief that taking a vacation is not a reason to be unavailable. Um, f*** that. Like, I also check my work emails when I'm away and I check my social media and stuff, but again, because it's mine. Like, when someone, like, if one of my writers it's just like, Simon, I'm, I'm not going to be around. Like, I'm off for a month or whatever. I'm like, I'm not like, mate, where's your scripts at? Or anything like that. I mean, to be fair, it's like freelance, so it's different. But it's still like, when someone tells me they're like off, I'm not like, oh, well, okay. Let me know. Are you at least on your... No! <laughs> no one gives a shit. Like, up on holiday. Jesus. Why? All work and no play makes Jack a dull and alarmingly unhealthy boy who's heading for early burnout. So be more like Colin, America. Only 9,053 days left until you're off. Savage. Public exposure. I may not be the biggest fan of public restrooms in the UK, but at least we get the fundamentals, right? For example, the whole reason of using a public uh, of using a private cubicle is that it's meant to be a bit private. Such a concept hasn't really caught on in America. Yeah. Pub well, hang on, I don't know what Danny's about to talk about. But in the UK, or like in Europe, in I feel like any other country in the world, you go to use like the cubicle, right? And that door comes all the way down to the bottom. Or maybe there's about this much space at the bottom. In America, it's like, why is it so high? Like, you can see, like, the big... You can see most of my legs. Why not do it down to the bottom? Some of them are even, like, fully sealed little rooms. So you can't even hear the mate person next to you taking a shit, which is really nice. What, what's up with the... the like, okay, why so much space? Why? This is weird. Such a concept hasn't really caught on in America, where using a public toilet is treated more like a social occasion in which you get an opportunity to shoot the breeze with your fellow lavatorial adventurers. Those gaps around the stall walls are frighteningly big, yes. It's not just the fact that a grown adult could in theory slide underneath the massive gap at the bottom of the doors while you're making a deposit at the porcelain bank. Yes, it's fucking, there's a big gap. Why, America? There's also weirdly big gaps at the sides, which allow you to poke it over and chat with your neighbor. You leave a bit big gaps around the edges of the door just in case you want to make eye contact with passers by in the restroom while <laughs> oh, you're building a dookie castle. <laughs>
Beautiful. It's no wonder the tourists feel so taken aback by using one of America's semi-exhibitionist restrooms for the first time. As one Reddit user put it, you could put a man on the moon, but you can't design a setup whereby I could take a dump in comfortable privacy. Sort it out, America. <laughs> but what's the reasoning behind the ludicrously big gaps? It's been suggested that it's to dissuade cubicle users from engaging in antisocial activity, such as having sex or snorting a few lines of coke in full view of everyone else in the room. Um, I don't know what, what you're talking about. Coke is a very social activity. You're not doing coke and then just going home and having a chill out. You're doing coke because it makes your life awesome. No, I'm just joking. It's not antisocial to do coke in a bathroom. What are you talking about? It's very so Enough. <laughs> But surely, using a toilet in the right way is not meant to be for public consumption either. It's true that toilets are easier to clean when you can just quickly shove your mop underneath the doors without having to open them up. It's also easier to share toilet paper with your neighbor, easier to spot someone in the cubicle who's passed out from the toxic fumes on the, pre the previous argument, <laughs> and it's easier to wiggle out of freedom if the toilet door gets stuck. I remember there was uh, there were some toilets. I think it was near where I lived in London, and they were always like illuminated in this like weird blue, and I'm like. Why have they got this weird ambient blue lighting? It's like, what are you going for like a mood in here in these like ugly ass public toilets? And then I found out that the reason for that is so people can't shoot up heroin in the toilets because you can't, apparently you can't see your veins so easily under blue light. And then I was like, oh, so it's not a mood thing. It's just an anti-heroin use thing. Kind of took the, uh, kind of took the vibe away a little bit, didn't it? What? You're just ruining it. You're ru look at my lips. You're ruining it. Ruining. Another theory is that US restrooms are purposefully designed to be a desperate last resort. But <laughs> public restrooms should always be a last resort. Unless you're like taking a sh in a nice hotel. Like, I don't know, I've backpacked and stuff, and there's nothing better than like, uh, you know, you're sweaty, it's unpleasant, you've been on a bus for like 14 days, and you're like, man, I need a big sh. And you're like, hmm, that Hilton looks nice. <laughs> you just wander into the Hilton lobby, beautiful air conditioning, there's a nice piano. Excuse me, uh, where are the where are the toilets? And they're like right this way, sir. <laughs> Just take a massive shit and leave. Yes, thank you, hotel lobbies. Because you are about to shit your pants. A friend of mine just used to work. He'd, he'd just go to like the. Uh, I think it was actually a Hilton. And it was just like, I had a really nice lobby at these desks and stuff that you could work at. He didn't, he never stayed there. He'd just use it like as a co-working space. And eventually they asked him if he was staying in the hotel and he never went back. It's like, no, I'm uh, waiting for my friends. And they're like, you're waiting for him every day, sir. <laughs> Can you leave? But the real reason is more likely to do with the fact that it's cheaper to mass produce the stalls if they're not being custom designed to fit flush with the walls and floors of a specific room. So why not just make them like that? Have this much space? You don't need this much space, do you? Just make them the same, flog them cheap, and don't worry about the differing sizes of gaps and peepholes left over after each installation. At least I can now begin to understand why nobody in their right mind could ever dream of actually charging an entry fee for these quite literal sh shows cash bail just a quick question i like to ask americans about your cash bail system what the actual flip america the rules seem pretty straightforward and fair in most of the rest of the world whilst awaiting trial there's a general presumption of bail unless you pose a significant risk to society any conditions of bail involve the subject agreeing to follow a perfectly reasonable set of restrictions money never comes into the equation yeah this is true like no one's like oh you're a bit risky so you're gonna have to pay like a really expensive bail it's like look if you're risky you stay in prison that's that's how it works <laughs> this is a far cry from the american justice system in which anyone suspected of a felony must spend months or even years languishing in a cell before their trial unless they're rich enough to buy their way out with cash bail set at an average of around ten thousand dollars although this can vary quite wild quite wildly also ten thousand dollars is a lot of money i don't think regular people have that kind of cash sitting around for bail right and also does it really take months or years that feels a bit like not just because then they're like holding you without what's it called like i think the maximum in the uk is like it's like 28 days or something and that's for like terrorist offenses i think it's three days before they charge you although maybe you can be charged and you're awaiting trial i don't know can it really be that long that seems very unfair and then it's like yeah you're not guilty and it's like oh, we're waiting in prison for a year and i know i'm not guilty you're just agreeing with me now what the fuck 
Oh, shit, I'm sorry. Of course, you get the money back after the court case is complete, and the whole point is to encourage you to show up to trial rather than do a runner and lose all that dough. If you're a bit short on funds, you could always obtain the money from a private bail bond company, but this involves paying them a non refundable 10 to 15% of the full amount up front, which is not always going to be a viable option if your bail has been set at $15,000 and you haven't got a pot to piss in. And if you skip bail without paying back the bondsman, you're going to have a bounty hunter on your tail who can pretty much do whatever he likes to track you down and recover the money. Isn't that one of those situations like if you're just just you got to leave. You got to go and like live in like Belize or something like that, right? <laughs> it's like you got to go. From here on out I'm Mr. Low Profile, just another douchebag with a job and three pairs of dockers. It's like the days of the old Wild West never reached the end credits. The only other country in the world to have spawned a lucrative commercial bail bond industry is the Philippines, that bastion of decency and honor where in 2016 former President Rodrigo Duterte urged citizens to shoot dead anyone they suspected of being a drug addict. Duterte's f***ing insane. That whole situation, his anti-drug thing in the Philippines, like, we could do a video on that because it's full on crazy. And the whole concept seems just a little bit twisted. Right now, about half a million Americans, many of them innocents, are awaiting trial in jail because they can't afford to pay the bail. That's about two thirds of the entire US jail population. No fucking way. And you know a lot of Americans are already in jail. Like, it's a high percentage. Oh my. Someone falsely accused of a traffic violation. Why are you going to go to prison for a traffic violation? This, I mean, unless you're like, your traffic violation is like running into a crowd of civilians. Um, civilians. <laughs> like, there's non civilians. I mean, like, um, uh, pedestrians. That's the right word. Uh, and you could potentially spend months in jail in a cell simply because you're poor, whilst someone accused of murder can stroll back home and have a celebratory party if mummy and daddy have a few millions stashed away under the mattress. It's not that uncommon for poorer people to plead guilty to minor offenses they didn't even commit just to avoid the dramatic long list of consequences from being incarcerated indefinitely. This is fully insane, America. You need to reform this shit. Is the talk of reforming this shit because there could be? I mean, there should be. And people of color are the ones who feel the impact the most. Not only are they more likely to be arrested in the first place, they're also more likely to be hit with a higher cash bail that they can't afford to pay, and more likely to be detained in jail as a result. And it feels very sad to say this, but uh, this doesn't shock me in any way at all, which really says something about the justice system, doesn't it, guys? That's another thing that we should maybe add to that list of shit that desperately needs reforming. This is outrageous. They put you in jail right away no trial no, no nothing innocent until proven guilty doesn't seem to apply in america unless you've got deep pockets there's a glimmer of hope for the future in the shape of cash bail reforms though new jersey and alaska have largely dropped cash bail whilst in 2021 illinois became the first u.s state to completely abolish this extortion racket altogether but doesn't that mean just everyone is now going to be waiting like so the jails are going to be super busy and i mean i i don't want to say obviously it's unfair because people with money get out on bail but isn't isn't it better that at least no it's not really is it it should just but they're in us some of the uh, uh, look obviously we're not going to solve this problem today are we california can't seem to make up its mind whilst a reform in new york in 2020 has effectively rolled right back been rolled right back after new york police claimed that it directly led to a spike in crime from reoffenders who had been allowed to walk free that's a very dubious claim which doesn't even add up criminals always had an opportunity to reoffend if they had enough money to post bail the new york police had just miffed at the prospect of poorer suspects being granted the same opportunities and respect as wealthy murderers drug barons danny that doesn't feel true <laughs> like police are really miffed about that um why i don't think they care it's not like the police are rich although in america the aspiration for richness is high so i think rich people in america are held in higher regard than they are in the rest of the world like it's like wow you got rich whereas in the rest of the world it's like <laughs> You got rich, who did you scam? Uh, <laughs> Critics of proposed reforms seem to be under the impression that it will lead to streets of America being awash with child molesters, but it surely can't be too difficult to follow the guidelines set by the rest of the world and grant bail on an assessment of a suspect's risk to the public rather than the fatness of their bank account. Yes, this that, that seems like the perfect system, doesn't it? I was trying to work it out, but that's it. Just do it on risk. Traffic offender... Uh, unless they did pile their car into a bunch of pedestrians, I think we're okay with them not being in prison. Aren't we? I think everyone's pretty okay with that. What did you do? I was going really a lot over the speed limit. 
kind of a dick move dangerous certainly uh, do you need to be in prison for that absolutely f- not especially if it's before trial um get great great idea take away their license while we wait easy put a gps machine on their car so that we can track if they're going why can't we do that we put the drug the, the thing that tests whether you're drunk on the cars why not just stick a gps tracker on there and be like yo mate if you speed we will know immediately and you will have your bail revoked it's not that hard it's not that hard this shouldn't be reliant on money this should be just reliant on this amazing thing called technology that we now have and i don't know using your sensible brain but perhaps that's easier said than done when the commercial bond industry is raking in two billion dollars worth of revenue every year yeah america again how about we don't let big bail bond dictate justice that would be nice wouldn't it along with the rest of the other big whatevers that that basically ruin a lot of that's just capitalism while being a dick we've talked about it before and i just watched that later season of goliath where he goes up against big pharma farmer man i mean don't because they do make some amazing drugs but that like opioid shit and all of that is nuts and the uh the 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 oh god what's it called um uh, where the people lo- lobbying the lobbying and shit, man that's it's just mental anyone who argues that cash bail is a fair and just concept is skating on very thin ice just please keep that thin ice well away from my scotch thank you danny thank you sam who edits these thank you me trinity of blaze boys and i'll see you next time in love ice F- you danny <laughs> just kidding i love you danny that means you're gay.